I'm going to talk to you about an idea that I have based on a novel by the German author Hermann Hesse. The novel is called Magister Ludi, or its other name is The Glass Bead Game. So what is a glass bead game? In Hesse's novel, a glass bead game is a futuristic society that does this exercise where they try and synthesize esoteric ideas like the relationship between music and color, the relationship between a meal that a composer ate and what he composed. And the winner of the glass bead game is the person who makes the most compelling argument for their synthesized ideas. It's a beautiful novel. This was actually my mother's copy of um, The Glass Bead Game. There are other writers who've sort of taken up the torch and done their own versions of it. I think of um, Richard Powers, for example, does a lot of synthesis in his novels of ideas that when you start the novel seem contradictory, but he weaves them together in beautiful ways. So today, I'm going to talk about two ideas that seem disconnected, yet I feel they can be synthesized. The first is the books by James Joyce. James Joyce wrote novels, short stories, and poetry as well. And these books are sometimes complex, sometimes impenetrably complex, but they're also beautiful and they have a very interesting structure. So I'm going to talk about the structure and sort of how he wrote these novels in some cases. And I'm going to relate it to another topic. In my career, I'm a database architect. And database also has structure and content. And there's also a history of databases, sort of how they grew up to where they are today. So I'm going to take these two ideas. On one hand, the novels of James Joyce. On the other hand, database architecture. And present my own glass bead game of their synthesis. The first Joyce novel that I'm going to talk about is actually not a novel. It's a collection of short stories called Dubliners. Dubliners is 15 short stories about characters and stories that take place in Dublin. Dubliners. Each story is self-contained. They may refer to other things and other parts of other stories, other places that are the same. But generally speaking, the stories can stand on their own. I relate this to the how we started with databases. We put information, for example, into files. Files that were distinct at how they were stored. We might have stored them on punch cards. Might have stored them on floppy disks. But they were not large. We didn't really have a concept of big data. At that time, five megabytes was even considered big data. So early databases were not really relational. They were file-based. That is, they stood alone, kind of like the stories in Dubliners. But they did have some context with each other. For example, all the stories in Dubliners take place in Dublin. All your files may relate to a particular project or something. But we really didn't have a mechanism for joining them together in the early days of databases. Joyce's second novel is A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. And this story follows the sometimes complicated relationship between a character, Stephen Dedalus, and his education, and the Catholic Church, and art, and a little bit, to some extent, his mother also. But it stands on its own as a novel. It's not a very long novel. It's not a very difficult novel to read. And most of it is told in third person. So you kind of can follow along the narrative very cleanly. And I re relate this to sort of the early days of transactional databases. Databases where you wanted to know what the state of a particular set of operations or something was at a point in time. 
So we built multiple tables, we related them to each other, and we were able to look at this data and say, well, when this thing was done, something was purchased, for example, this is what the data looked like. And you can do that with the portrait of the artist. You can understand where Stephen is at a particular point in time. You can follow the narrative up to that point and after that point. But it's also not, like I said, not a very large novel. We didn't have, at that time, a lot of large data either as we were starting to build out this idea of relational databases. But databases did get larger. The quantity of data we were storing got larger. And so our methods for storing it and the way we structured that data also got more complex. And likewise, Joyce's third novel, Ulysses. Now, Ulysses is his masterpiece. And you can just tell from looking at it, it's a much bigger book. It's also a much more complex book in terms of the way it's written. It's written in a combination of third-person narrative, first-person narrative, but also something called interior monologue, where it's the thoughts of the characters in the novel. Interestingly enough, the character of Stephen Dedalus from A Portrait of the Artist actually starts the novel of Ulysses. It's about Stephen Dedalus as his life is continuing. And it goes on to include some other characters, most notably Leopold Bloom, who takes us through his day. Now, this is very interesting when you think about how a novel is structured and how databases are structured. Because Ulysses is very unique. It takes place over the course of a single day. So this entire novel, 730 pages, is all about one day from different perspectives. And in databases, we also can store data that way. They're called time series databases, where we can store measurements from devices, for example. And we can structure them along a timeline, and we, we can look at two different devices and see where they line up with each other, where the barometer was dropping, the wind speed was going up, for example. In Joyce's novel, this shows up as events that happen at the same time. There's a wonderful scene in the first part of the novel where Stephen Dedalus is walking along the beach and he sees a cloud pass in front of the sun. And Stephen, being the moody, introspective guy that he is, kind of relates this to his mood. But later in the novel, Leopold Bloom is walking around Dublin, running his errands in the morning, and he also sees that same cloud pass in front of the sun. To him, it means something completely different. It isn't the same thing as Stephen, but it's also these events line up with each other. And to me, this represents kind of two different types of database architecture that came about in the late 90s and early 2000s. One of those is document databases. That is how we store information where we keep all the information about a particular thing. Maybe it's an object you're selling or something in one place. And we do this so that we can make that information really quickly available to someone else that needs to consume it. And this is interesting in terms of Joyce's novel because you can pick up Ulysses and follow along and understand that a certain section of it is going to contain everything you need to know about that particular place. For example, when Leopold Bloom walks into a business, a bar, whatever it is he's walking into, and the way he describes it, he describes it completely. But not only what he sees, but what he's thinking about it, too. It can make the book very challenging to read sometimes until you learn the voices that are going on in it. This sort of switching back and forth between narrative and interior monologue. But it also makes it a fascinating and beautiful book to read. And likewise, with databases, now we have multiple kinds of databases. We have our traditional relational databases. We have dimensional databases to deal with big data, big data like a big novel. We have time series databases to deal with time. But Joyce didn't stop there. Joyce went on to write after Ulysses, which did take him a long time to write and get published. It's a story on its own. But Joyce's next and final novel is Finnegan's Wake. And Finnegan's Wake is difficult to read. 
Actually, it's not difficult to read because there's, it's just words. You can read the words. But it's not a narrative in the typical way that we think of a novel. That is, it has a start, an arc, and a finish. It's more experiential than that. And the interesting thing that I learned when I was studying Joyce was that when Joyce was writing it, he didn't write it in a linear fashion either. He would come up with an idea. He would hear some words that he thought sounded good together. And that was it. And he would form something around that. He would say, well, what would happen before that? What would happen after that? How would I extend that out into what I've already created in this amazingly creative book? And the interesting thing is that where he has what we call these nodes of information and they intersect with each other like waves and you'll, it's hard to explain, but there's this idea that the interesting things in Finnegan's Wake happen where you understand that something does relate to something else in the book, but it's more in like a transient way that is not super concrete. Similarly, in the world of databases, we now can structure information nodally also. We can create nodes of information like a subject and an object, and we can have a predicate in between them. So an example of this would be a subject, Frank, for example, an, ob an object, say a city like Dornburn, and the predicate of lives in, Frank lives in Dornburn. And when I start stacking these, these what we call triples on top of each other, we end up with what we call a graph database. And in a graph database, it's the nodes themselves that we relate to each other. So we aren't structuring information in tables. We aren't structuring information into stories. We're looking at things nodally. We we're going to look across the entire graph model, for example, to understand relationships between objects that may not even seem to be related originally. You may say, well, this person used a credit card, but they have a bank account over here, but they were born in this city over here, and they share a telephone number with somebody over here. What does that tell you? To me, that's a lot like reading Finnegan's Wake, experiencing <laughs> Finnegan's Wake rather than reading in some cases. And many times in Finnegan's Wake, when you read it, you have to look at the whole. You can't just look at the, the, the individual thing. You have to look at how this fits into the entire structure of the novel. And interestingly enough, in this novel, when you get to the end of it, you read all the way through it, very few people do, it actually wraps around. And the last sentence in the novel leads you to the first sentence in the novel. And this idea of a circular nature is something that we also do in graph databases. We understand that information may flow in loops, not just structured in tables. So this is my glass bead game. Understanding how database architecture has evolved from small, flat files that are standalone and can stand on their own as a story, a short story, but they can stand on their own, to a more relational model where we have the entire transaction available to us, and then to big data, where I need to structure diff information in multiple ways. I have time series data. I have information in documents. I have information multimedia. All of that goes into how we store information. And lastly, we have something that's done nodally, where it's created in a way that I'm relating things to each other in real time. I may insert something in the middle and relate it back to something in the beginning, but I didn't plan it out that way. It just sort of grew organically that way. That's also very much what we do today in graph databases. So this is my glass bead game. I hope you enjoyed it. And I would love to hear your comments and thoughts about perhaps areas in your life or in your career where you see this synthesis of things that no one else really feels the way that you do about it. Thank you so much for your time.